Lord, we love our country. Countless souls to be won. Jesus, bring revival that your will may be done through us. Lord, we already sense you're moving. We know that you are doing something already. Lord, help us that this day, this hour, this time, we'll be able to go. Oh Lord, start with us. Begin with us. Who will go for you, Lord? Who will go for you, Lord? Here we are, Lord. Send us. Send us, Lord. Send us. As we look around us, we see the challenges of other religious people. As we look around us, we look at the people that are perishing. As we look around us, we see lives that are being wasted. As we look around us, we see the people that are dying without hope, without Christ, without salvation, without eternal life. And Lord, we surrender ourselves today that in this country, in this age and this hour, you will use us to reach out with the gospel in Jesus' name. We pray that anything that will hinder us, material things, academic things, political things, social things, oh Lord, you will take everything away in Jesus' name. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Men are perishing, women are perishing, teenagers are perishing, sinners are perishing, all the people in the hospitals are perishing, the prisoners are perishing, the villagers are perishing, the educated are perishing, the lowly people, poor people, illiterates are perishing. Oh Lord, the demon possessed people are perishing. Habalists are perishing. Juju people are perishing. All the people around us in our zone, in our district, in our area, in our house fellowship, even our members of the family, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our parents, people are perishing. In the schools, everywhere, oh Lord, we pray that your fire will come upon us. We pray that your glory will come upon us. We pray that your spirits will come upon us and you will send us out and we will go and rescue the perishing in Jesus' name. Wherever they are, these countless souls, these multitudes of people that are going to hell, oh Lord, we pray you give us a body, you give us a conviction, you give us a vision. You give us the co command, you give us the concern, you give us the challenge, so that we'll reach out and reach them in Jesus' name. Lord, whatever we are to do, in the day hours and in the night hours, whatever we are to do, in the cinema halls, on the field of the sports people, in the hotels, everywhere we may be, everywhere we may go, oh Lord, we pray, you give us the fire, you will give us the vision. You will give us the insight that we will rescue the perishing in Jesus' name. Lord, begin with us. Lord, start with us. We have surrendered ourselves. We have surrendered everything that we have. Use us to save the perishing in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray. Evangelism will be our priority. Evangelism will be our number one job. Evangelism will be something we do in the day and in the night. We'll pray about it. We'll walk about it. We'll give concerning it. We'll run concerning it. We'll do it everywhere we may find ourselves. That Lord, everywhere we'll get souls saved. Every day we'll get souls saved. Every time we'll get souls saved. Lord, every laziness, every indolence, everything that is making us to sleep, everything that is making us to fold our hands, everything that has deafened us, everything that has blinded us, Take everything away in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that children will be saved, young people will be saved, adults will be saved. We pray that villagers will be saved, illiterates will be saved. Everybody we see around us will reach out to them. They will be saved in Jesus' name. 
Lord, as we have been stagnant, as we have been sleeping, as we have been making no progress in the house fellowship, in the area, in the zone, in the district, among the women, among the students, among the full-time workers, among every one of us involved in the area of the work. Oh Lord, we are praying the challenge we need, the conviction we need, the fire we need, the dynamite we need, the power that we need. You pour upon us in Jesus' name. That Lord, when we preach, Lord, when we pray, Lord, when we witness, Lord, when we serve you, we'll serve you with all our energy. We'll serve you with all our zeal. That people around us who are perishing, they will not perish in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that you need more laborers. And we are praying that as we surrender ourselves, we will not only serve you, we'll bring others to serve you. We will influence others to serve you. Many Christians who are dormant, many Christians who are just coming to church, many Christians who are just coming to our fellowship, who are not involved, who are folding their hands, who are closing their minds, who have no vision, who sense no call, who are just going from day to day, and many people are perishing around us. Use us to inspire them. Use us to encourage them. Use us to get them involved in Jesus' name. Lord, speak to our hearts now. Speak to our hearts now. Speak to our hearts now. So that we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Your voice called unto Isaiah and said, Who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And Isaiah did not waste time. He did not beat about the bush. He did not say, let me finish my profession yet. He did not say, let me go for farming yet. He did not say, let me do agriculture first. He did not say, let me do politics first. He did not say, I need to edu get educated first. He said, immediately. He said, immediately. He said, immediately. Here am I, send me. And Lord, we are praying that this afternoon we surrender ourselves. Here we are, send us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Everywhere, let us work for you. Every time, let us work for you. Wherever people are dying in sin, let us work for you. Wherever people are ignorant of the gospel, let us work for you. Wherever it appears people are lame and they cannot walk in the way of righteousness. Where it appears people are blind and they cannot see the way of eternal life. Where it appears people are deaf and they cannot hear the message of the Lord. Use us to sound the gospel to them in Jesus' name. Give us enough power. Give us enough vision. Give us enough interest. That Lord, through us, this city will be shaken. Through us, this nation will be shaken. Through all this continent of Africa will be shaken in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we pronounce Lagos for Jesus. In every zone, it will be Lagos for Jesus. In every district, it will be Lagos for Jesus. O oh Lord, we pronounce and we proclaim Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. In the north, Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. In the west, Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. In the east, Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. In the schools and colleges, Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. In the village and the cities, Nigeria will be for Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, this continent of Africa, the communist countries, the socialist countries, the Muslim countries, and the nominal Christian countries, Africa will be for Christ in Jesus' name. Use us as missionaries. Use us as evangelists. Use us as preachers. Use us as people that will turn multi to the Lord in Jesus' name. Until we'll spend our energy, until we'll spend our money, until we'll spend all our sweat, until we'll spend, uh, spend all our blood. Oh Lord, we pray we will not rest in Jesus' name. Until Africa will bow to Jesus. Until every knee in Africa, every tongue in Africa, will confess that Jesus is Lord in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, there is nothing we are reserving. Lord, there is nothing we are reserving. We pray that you will use every one of us in Jesus' name. In West Africa, in East Africa, in Southern part of Africa, in the Northern part of Africa, reach out to every place in Jesus' name including Central Africa. Lord, we pray you will use every one of us. We will not depend upon other people. We will not look up to other people. We will not shirk our responsibility. We will not push it to other people. We are the people you will use. 
We are the people you will use. We are the people that you will use. We are the people that you will use. We place our lives on the altar. We place our money on the altar. We place our energy on the altar. We place our career on the altar. We pray our families on the altar. We pray our knowledge on the altar. Everything that we have, everything that we possess, we are going to use for your glory in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, don't bypass us. Don't use other people and neglect us. Don't use other people and reject us. Don't use other people and overlook us. Oh Lord, our energy. O oh Lord, our strength. O oh Lord, our money. O oh Lord, our knowledge. O oh Lord, our background. O oh Lord, our present. O oh Lord, our future. O oh Lord, our family. Everything that we have. Use us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have done it. We know you will do it. We know you will not fail us. And we will not fail you. It will be done in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. In the session before us now, we want to quickly consider the challenge of other religions. The challenge of other religions. We often look at people with other religions with scorn and disdain. God's word condemns idolatry and commands believers that we should flee from idols and we should not get involved in the religion of anyone that does not recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior, the only Savior. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Here we give on the commandment that we shall forsake or avoid idol worship in every form, in every shape, wherever it is practiced, by whoever may be practicing it. In First Corinthians chapter 8, from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 8 from verse 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. But when you see brethren and wound against Christ, here again we are commanded that we shouldn't even eat things that have been sacrificed to idols, that if we go to the temple of the idol worshiper to eat with them, to worship with them, to partake of their rituals and ceremonies, will we not then offend people and make them weak? And that their weak consciences will be so offended, they might backslide. And when we sin so against the brethren by the wrong example of getting involved in idol worship, we sin against the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, the sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. We are not to have fellowship with devils devils. All this is clear in the word of God so that we do not get involved in the worship of idol worshippers. Yet, on the other hand, the Bible challenges us with the zeal, the commitment, and the devotion of men of these 
other religions. We do not worship with them. We do not partake with them. We do not get involved in their ceremonies with them. And yet, the Bible challenges us with the attitude of these religious people and their attitude, their commitment, their zeal, and the way they do what they do in their religion condemn us who are in the true faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 1 verse 7 through to verse 9 Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar and ye say wherein have we polluted thee in that Ye say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? You can see the challenge the Lord himself is posing here. He's posing the challenge that the people that offer things to human people, offer sacrifices to human people, deities that they have chosen, a governor that they have made a deity, if they were to offer those polluted things, those things having blemish, will the governor accept from their side? Or even if they are not worshipping idol, but they are not born again, and they give some presents or gifts to a governor in their social life, if those things are having blemish, will the governor appreciate that kind of gift? And God was telling the children of Israel, if the governor will not accept it from you, do you think I will accept it from you? He was giving them challenge on the basis of what the religious people of the day were doing to their governors, to their human deities, or to their human rulers. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 9, Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead, for pass over the isles of Chittim and see. Send unto Kida and consider diligently. And see if there be any such, if there be such a thing as a nation changed their gods, which are yet no, nation, no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Here God himself challenged the children of Israel on the basis of the commitment of the idol worshippers. He said, as a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods, God was telling the children of Israel, look at the commitment of the idol worshippers. Look at the tenacity of purpose in the idol worshippers. Look at the constancy and consistency of the idol worshippers. Look at the steadfastness of the idol worshippers. Do they change their religion every year? Do they change their gods, their idols every season? Do they not worship those idols when they are young, when they are growing, when they become old? As a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods are they not united as a nation are they not united together in purpose in direction in their worship and yet they commit themselves to never changing even though what they are worshiping they are useless vain idols and yet they never change and then god now told the children of israel verse 12 be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, 
For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He said, all the idol worshippers, they don't change. They remain consistent. They are very steadfast. They are very zealous. But he said, my people have changed their religion. He said, my people have turned away from the fountain of living waters and they have healed for themselves cisterns that can hold no water. So you can see the controversy of God with the children of Israel. He was throwing a challenge to them from the people of other religions. And I want to bring some things to you today on the basis of what I see religious people doing. On the basis of the challenge that God himself has thrown to the children of Israel, we need to see this challenge for the children of God even today. Let's look at Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, reading from verse 1 and verse 2. And it came to pass, when all the kings on the other, that which were on the other side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together, to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. One thing we see among people of other religions is the unity of purpose. Their abandonment of other interests to fight against whoever they consider as their one single central enemy. And they never fight against themselves. Look at the land here. And look at the Muslims, for example. And see how they are united in their purpose. In wanting a mosque in every street. They want people to worship the way they worship. And they are united in that purpose. And it doesn't matter whether they are northerners or southerners, they want to be united in that purpose. What a challenge to people who know Jesus Christ. A challenge to people who know about eternal life, that we should be united in our purpose of following the Lord. Look at the commitment of these people that I've mentioned. Even the beggars, even the people that have no job, even the people that cannot afford to have three square meals a day, they will try to go to their holy land. They must, because it is one of their tenets of faith. If they don't, they have not practiced their religion very well. If they have to sell everything that they have, they will do everything they can do. And their relatives will never go against them for selling their property so they can go to the holy land. What a challenge. Even those of us in Lagos here, we are not talking about getting passports. We are not talking about going to another country. We are not talking about going to a holy land. By the grace of God, this is our headquarters church. Do you know there are people who cannot sell everything they have so as to come to the central church? You see, when Muslims see other people that are trying their best to go to the holy land, they give them money. They help them. They assist them. Do you know there are people in our midst here? We cannot assist one another in coming to the presence of God and coming to worship. When the people on a Friday, for example, when they know they ought to worship, when they feel that they ought to go to a particular place of worship and they do not have how to be able to help themselves, other people will help them. Do you know how they try to get people converted into their religion? They can call a person who is a so-called uh, Christian, maybe nominal church goer. They say, why are you not worshipping God? Because the way they understand, that's the only way they can worship God. They don't recognize that Christians are worshipping God in truth and in spirit because they are in darkness. 
But you know, they will call some people and they say, what do you need? What's your problem? You need money? You need job? That's the job. And a promotion is waiting for you. You need 10,000 naira, 50,000 naira. Take it, but make sure you join religion. But do you know there are managers in the Christian fold that they see other Christians that are jobless. They never can do anything to encourage those Christians to remain Christians. Do you know there are Christians who will know where vacancies are? They can never come together and say, Brother, we see you don't have any job. We see, sister, we see you don't have any job. What do you want? What do you need? Christians cannot even joke with five naira. Not to talk of 15 naira to give to another person. Christians, if they invite somebody to come to the church with them, and they say, come to church with me, come to church with me, and uh, the person says, well, I am sorry. I would like to go, but you know, I don't have anything, and I cannot uh, have transportation money. Ah, well, in our zone, uh, we are owing transportation money. Therefore, if you don't have money to go to church, I'd like you to go, but I'm sorry. Uh, there's nothing I can do. I'm also looking on the face of the Lord myself. A Muslim will never do that. You, if a Christian, a nominal Christian, will go to an allergy and say, allergy, I want to go to Mecca. And I'm interested because my mind is turning away from the church. The man will say, what? Yeah, you, do you really mean it? Yes, I mean it, but you know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have money. I don't have passport. He will say, give me your name. Give me your local government. Passport will come out in one week. Because that church goer wants to change his religion. He wants to go to Holy Land. But you tell Christian. And say, Christian, I want to go to retreat with you. But I'm sorry, I've not been working for the past three months and I cannot uh, have anything so that I will go. If you really want to go, you will try. I have money, I have car. Even though the car is not full, but uh, well, I don't just pick anybody like that. If you really want to go to retreat, try your best. If you need to sell your motorcycle, go and sell whatever you can sell. But me, for me to give you transportation money, nothing like that. What a shame that people of other religions will sacrifice. They will give money. They will give their time. They will give their interest. They will give everything they have so that they can be united in purpose in making people to follow their religion. But Christians are not zealous. Even gospel Christians, evangelical Christians, the people who say they have the Spirit of God, they do not have the zeal, the love, the sacrifice, the commitment, and the unity. Now can you see, if a Christians are trying to build, maybe we're trying to build a building like this, we've been here since January. And this is, you know, the level where we are now. And if it's, you know, people of other religions and they want to build like that, in a, in a few months, everybody, this one will bring that, this one will bring that, this one will bring that, uh, cement factory will bring this, uh, the people painting will bring that, tiles workers, production workers will bring that. In six months, they are finished, but not Christian, not Christian. We have Jesus, but we don't know the importance of Jesus. We have eternal life, we don't, have him, we don't know the importance of eternal life. We know we're going to heaven, but we don't know the importance of getting other people along with us to get to heaven. You have to talk and talk and talk and talk. If you read in the papers yesterday, you will discover that in one stage, some Muslim uh, people, they donated 500 uh, naira, I think, to a church. And they also gave them many, many uh, copies of their Holy Quran. And he spoke to the pastor there. They said, we're giving you this. It's a gift. Don't worry to pay for it. We'll give you. And uh, we want you to teach your people so that at least they have understanding of how we Muslims, how we think, how we worship, and what we believe. Enlighten your people. And they do donated to them all the Holy Korans. And you know those Christian beggars? They stretch out their hand like this. They cannot donate Bible to the other and say, okay, you donate Quran to us. We too, we are going to donate Holy Bible to you. No, they are poor. They don't have Bible to donate. They don't have money to donate. And these people, in trying to evangelize them, 
they don't know that it's a method whereby these people, as they begin to read the Quran and read all this and they get interested, then they eventually the Malan will come and say, I can even give my free time, free hour to come and teach your people on our way of worship so that you can understand us little by little you'll find that a whole building that is called a church will be turned to a mosque but christians will be sleeping we do not have any challenge or take any challenge from the people that are in other religions but the lord is saying there is a challenge look at what they're doing look at how united they are uh, you see, the Christians will be fighting one another, destroying one another, opposing one another. But you see the people, do you see idol worshippers doing that? Do you see them tearing down their idols or their shrine? Do you see them breaking up? But Christians, it's a different thing. The Lord is challenging us. He's saying, if people that do not have Christ... People that do not have eternal life, people that do not have the grace of God, if they can be disunited, why are we not united in the purpose of our calling? I pray we'll be united. I pray we'll do our work. Everything that we're to do, we're going to do. So that if we need to spend our money, we need to spend our time, whatever we need to do, we'll bring people into the gospel message in Jesus' name. The other thing you discover among people of other religions is boldness. Boldness. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when we are in a meeting like this, and we mention Muslim or Islam, some people, even though they are Christians, they become afraid. They become afraid because they are not free to even mention that name, whether for an illustration purpose or for a preaching purpose. Much the other people in the other religions, if they want to mention Christ or Christianity over the loudspeaker, and they will be talking here, and they will hear in about two kilometers, they don't worry. They are bold. They are bold. We have the Holy Spirit, no boldness. We have the Bible, no boldness. We have eternal life, no boldness. We are very afraid. We are practicing our religion undercover. But the other people, they don't practice their religion undercover. They know what they think they believe, and they want to follow through. In 1 Samuel, I'm reading from chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4, from verse 6. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God is come into the camp. They said, Woe unto us. For there has not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men. O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you, quit yourselves like men, and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was meeting, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. You see the children of Israel, they had seen Ophna and Phinehas, was on the battlefield. They went to take the ark of the Lord. When the ark of the Lord came, they shouted. But that's all they can do. Only shouting. And the Philistines became afraid momentarily. All of a sudden, the Philistines said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Abandon every other thing and fight. And you see, they killed of the children of Israel 30,000 footmen. You see the unbelievers, you see the politicians, you see religious people, you see idol worshippers, they are very bold. They are very bold to do what they want to do. And generally, they will prevail on whatever government may be there. Let's say, for example, the idol worshippers wanted to have their festival. And uh, in the country, they say, you cannot do this, you cannot do this. They'll carry their masquerades and come out with their weaves. 
if they say that, well, if women walk in the street at that time, they are going to beat the women, even if it's a policewoman that, you know, stands in the way, a woman for them is woman. They will do what they want to do, and after that, they will be looking into the consequence. But believers, once they tell them, don't give anybody any tract, don't talk in the marketplace to anybody to become a Christian, don't influence anybody to go with you to church. Don't invite anybody for house fellowship. And don't use your house for religious worship. The next house is being used for another religion with loudspeaker that is blaring to everybody in the community. The Christian will tell all the people coming for house fellowship, did you hear announcement? We are not to read Bible in the house anymore. We are not to have quiet time anymore. We are not to pray anymore. You see, that's the attitude. And yet, you see all these uh, people I've read to you in the Bible, the Philistines, they were bold. They knew that if they submitted to these children of Israel, they'll be defeated. And as idol worshippers, even though their idol had no power, you will see that among the children of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant had great power. When it was put in their temple, in a um, in the temple in the house of Dagon. Dagon fell down. And yet, the people that had such presence of God with them, they didn't do everything they ought to do and make sure that revival and the power of God was still in their midst. And you will find that this is the way of the Christian even today. Many Christians will be hiding. At this time of poverty, people will say, you know this time of poverty, we cannot do anything anymore. Christians, we cannot have retreat. Christians, we cannot have crusade. You know, idol worshippers, they never miss their festival. Never. There may be austerity. There may be no yam. There may be no crop. There may be famine. Out of the scarcity of food that people don't have food to eat, they don't have meat to eat, out of the yam that people are looking for and there is not enough yam, they will take out of that yam, they will sacrifice. Out of the fact that there is not enough meat for people to eat in the market or buy in the market, they will take the fowls remaining and the goats remaining and the sheep remaining, they will sacrifice. Or have you found a particular year when the religious people will say, we cannot kill goat, we cannot kill ram for a festival this time, there is austerity? No. Even if they will not eat their three square meals a day, they must kill that ram. But Christian, they cannot go to church, there's no money. They cannot come for Bible study, you know, there's no money. Even in our retreat here now, there are people who are expected to come, they are not here, you know why? Well, you know the condition. If I take all this time off and I went to retreat, you know, I have children at home who are going to eat. Idol worshippers never do that. If there is time of harvest, or if there is time of festival, they do their festival. Why is it Christians cannot worship God? Dry season, rainy season, austerity, or plenty, or whatever. Why is it believers cannot worship God? You know, the people that are worshipping idol, openly, they worship the idol. They may go to university. When they come back from university, in their houses, they will worship their idol. University will not take idol worship from them, except when they are born again. But you know, Christians, once they go to university and come back, and you talk about quiet time, Bible reading, going to church, oh, they say, when I was in school, a young man, a young lady. I used to follow all that religion, but you know now, I am educated. My friends, idol worshippers will never do that. Ask them in your state. Ask them in your village. The people that worship idol, when they come back from their university, if they have not been born again, they go back to their idol worship. Some people, they say, you know, I am married now, I don't have time. Ask people that are worshipping idol. When they have got married, they continue in the idol worship if they are not born again. But Christians cannot continue. What a shame. The challenge we have from all these people of other religions is that we should serve the Lord without looking back. I want you to look at Daniel 3. From verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold 
whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. You know, you can, what I'm pointing out here is the cost of this idol made of gold. Very big, very weighty, made of gold. And you see idol worshippers, they spend all the money they need to spend. They are not stingy when it comes to spending money on their religion. Right now, in Ivory Coast, the president of uh, Ivory Coast has built a magnificent um, temple because he's a Catholic. And uh, in all of Africa, they tell us that there is no temple that is as costly as that. And yet, in that country, there are difficulties. There is austerity. And as the man was interviewed, he said he built that thing with his money, not national money, and the money of his sister. Now, as you look at what these people are doing, people in other religions, single-handedly, or just the two of them, they will build magnificent temple. And you will find that such people, whenever they have a house there, they will want to build something to represent their temple. We have been uh, looking for land, for example, in every district, saying that we want a church in every district to minimize the difficulties of our people coming from Ajegunle, coming from Morocco, coming from all these faraway places. Now, in those places, we have people that can buy a whole factory. We have people that are buying land for factory buying land for a lot of other uses but then they know that the church is looking for land but their business must go on they must get land so that they can expand and they must have all these machines you know in our tape ministry sometimes if you buy the tapes you say ah what is uh, wrong at the beginning or maybe at the end or sometimes in the middle because the heads of those tapes are getting maybe worn out and there are people that have factories of this and this and that in communication. Now, if it was another religion, immediately they will take it up. Immediately. And they will not ask the people in their religion to come and contribute money. They will do it immediately because of their interest in the religion. Can you see the Nebuchadnezzar here? He made a big image. How did he get the money? Well, as an emperor, he knew how to get the money. He had the wisdom to get the money. The people of other religions, they will not leave any stone unturned. They will use all their influence. They will use all the money they have to build whatever they have to build. Not only that, but two. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the cherries, and all the rulers, nobody is left out. When those idol worshippers worship their idol, they do it unashamedly. And if we are to worship God in spirit and in truth, we do it unashamedly. He gave invitation to people. And he never missed anybody out in sending out the cards to them. The governors, the princes, the captains, the judges. Do you know there are people that are in high position in our church, in their places of work? And if they were people of other religions, they will be more active than they are. Take a manager in the bank, for example. If he's of another religion, as the people are coming to collect money from the bank, and he's, you know, he has contact with the governor, he has contact with all these highly placed people, he will tell them, he will tell them with bold face, with assurance and with audacity and authority, he will say, uh, governor, or prince, or so and so, or journalist, you know that our festival is coming, and I invite you, you must come. And if you are saying well, you say no, no, you must make it at this time. And then he'll try to influence you. But if he's a Christian, the Christian is so backward, he's so ashamed, will be covering his religion, can never give out any tract as a manager, as a director. 
He can never give any tract. As the principal of vice principal of a school, even when we're having a school outreach to students, the person, even though this person is the principal, he cannot tell all the children and say, uh, we're doing something very good to help you, can never open his mouth, can never open her mouth. Be unbelievers in the world don't do that. They don't do that. If they want to get anything done in their religion, they invite everybody. Not only that, it says in verse 3, and the princes, and the governors, and the captains, and the judges, and the treasurers, and the counselors, and the cherries, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, and nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, uh, harp, sackbot, satri, dulcima, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. You know the point I'm making to you here? Any, anybody that is going to play musical instrument, whether in the hotel or in the nightclub, or in the church, or at the time of the dedication of the image of Nebuchadnezzar, it takes time to practice, no matter where you are playing instruments. To play the harp will take time. To play all these uh, instruments will take time. The flute, the cornet, the sackbut, the druslima, all kinds of musical instruments they needed to learn. But you see, it is in the church that you know some people will say, you know, I am not educated. I cannot learn. I cannot study anything. Therefore, I cannot do music. That's, the church has problem, and it's unfortunate. We get eternal life. We never do anything back to the Lord. We get heaven waiting for us. We never give anything back to the Lord. The Lord went to the cross, and he died for us. We never pay anything back to the Lord. We get healing. We get deliverance, we get miracle, we get signs, we get wonders, we get salvation, we get heaven, we get holiness, we get provision, we get answered prayer, we never do anything back. But you see, the idol worshippers, they never get anything except problem, except nightmare, except headache. They serve the devil and they suffer for it and they keep on serving the devil. They keep on serving the devil. You will find the unbelievers as they are dying or before they die, they will call their child in the city of Lagos. They will say, come, come back home. All the work you are doing in the office at home, leave it. I'm soon about to die. Come and take over the worship of this idol. I, if the child said, Papa, I'm a university boy now. I cannot worship idol. I say, if you don't take up the idol worship, I will curse you. It means you are not my child again. Because this idol, my father worshipped it. My forefathers worshipped it. I worshipped it. You must worship this idol. Leave all the work you are doing in Lagos. Come and serve the idol in the village. Sometimes all the villagers will, will get to the man. And they will say, your papa is about to die. And you know that he is a chief in our clan, in our area here. And you are the one to take over. If the boy says, no, I'm sorry, I cannot do that hard. They say, if you dare do it, your father has given you as a gift to idol worship. If you don't do it, they will curse him. Except he's born again. Except he's a child of God. If they curse him, he's in trouble. But you know, Christians, Christians will say, my child, I am Zona leader, but <laughs> go for your education. Don't let coordinator see you. Go. Uh, the mother will call the child and say, my baby, come, my child, come here. If you let pastor see you, that you know Bible, and you raise up your hand in church, and you answer Bible properly, the pastor will call you and say, you should be working for God, be careful, never raise up your hand, don't let pastor know you, they're looking for workers. But I am your mother, I'm working for God, but you go to school, go and better your life. Unbelievers will never do that. Unbelievers will get people to teach their children the way of their religion. 
And when they are about to die, they will put that idol upon their child and say, child, I've worshipped that thing, you continue. But Christian, no. Christian, no. These idol worshippers, they will judge us on the last day. All these musicians that played at the dedication of the idol of Nebuchadnezzar will judge the people that God is calling to come and sing, to come and play musical instruments. And they say, no, I cannot study. How did these people worship an idol? How did they study? You see, these people, they will dedicate everything that they have. And they invited everybody. They said, all the citizens and all the foreigners. And when they said there were people that didn't worship, they had guards, they had ushers, they had supervisors. All their supervisors were vigilant. Look, there were only three people among thousands of people that did not bow down to the worship of that image. The supervisors were sharp. They sought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know today, if you are doing anything as we are here, you put supervisors in charge, 30 people will go out of the gate there to go back to the town and leave the workers meeting here. All the supervisors will not see 30 people. The supervisors in idol worship, they saw the only three people that didn't worship the idol. Only three. Supervisors today, they don't see any problem. They don't see any, people, any, any person that is running away. You have in one single zone, you have a zonal leader, you have women representative, you have many area leaders, you have a school visitor, you have a lot of people, and yet souls are backsliding and going away, they will never see them. Look at these people here, they were very sharp. Idol worshippers, they, they know what they are doing. Even though they are walking in darkness, even though they do not know the Lord, they put all their strength, all their vigilance, everything that they have into it, they will spend their money and their energy. And they draft all the members of their family into that worship. Do you know some of us here uh, who, have been, uh, who have been becoming Christians? You became a child of God. Maybe you are the wife. And your husband is a Catholic. And this Catholicism, it doesn't even go to this church maybe except once in a month. It goes to a mass maybe once in three months. And then you become born again. And you say, I'm now going to deeper life. This religious man, he will, he will say, no, you cannot go. We are Catholic, we are going to die as Catholic. This man that is going to die a Catholic, he doesn't go more than once in three months. Or maybe once a year. And then he will begin to persecute you. He will begin to talk. In the morning, he will talk. In the afternoon, he will talk. If you cook food, he says, no, I will not eat except you come to church. If you do anything, you say, no, I, I'm not interested except you follow me to Catholic church. He will go and search out father immediately. He has not seen father for three years. But now because you became a Christian, he will go to search for father and say, my house is in trouble. What's the trouble? My wife has become a Christian, has become born again, and is following after deeper life. Now please come and deliver me. And then father will call uh, this uh, lady and say, what's the matter with you? Are you? Don't you know you are Catholics and you must die Catholics? These people, they are zealous for their religion. But you know, if it's in our church here, you have been coming to the church, your wife is a worker. You are a worker. And one day your wife said, uh, my husband, I am tired today. I don't uh, think I will be going to a workers meeting anymore. After all, I'm an illiterate. My head is very dull. And I can't uh, do much. Husband will say, well, just think about it and pray about it. Uh, whatever you decide is in your hand. If zonal leader asks me, I'll tell him to go and ask you because I don't want to get involved in this. You don't want to get involved. You don't want to encourage your wife to remain in that thing. If it is in the world, the unbeliever, the unbeliever will say, what? In my house? No. You are a worker. You will die as a worker. If you don't keep in that work, if you cook, your food will not be sweet in my mouth. If you don't continue that evangelism, ah, deeper life. A church in this Nigeria with all the light following like this, they made you woman representative and you are not happy. I am a lucky man because you are my wife, you are a woman representative. My wife, if you drop that thing, this house, I, I will not fight you, but I will not be happy. I will be crying and weeping and praying until you get back to that work. Christian will never do that. 
Or if it is a, a woman that has been a, maybe in another religion and the husband now became a Christian, a born again Christian, the wife will say, In this house, <laughs> I will show you. The woman immediately will go to the in-law, will go to the father, will go to the mother, will go to the neighbors, will get to the manager, will get to the office and say, come and deliver me, oh, my house is on fire. My husband has gone to join a deeper life. And everybody will be coming to say, what's the matter? And then in the night, the woman will be saying, ah, this deeper life, I don't accept. I don't want it because now no television, now no jewelry, now this one and that one. I will never follow you to that church. Count me out. And even if your pastor comes here, I will tell him. Not everybody will go to deeper life. And we are not deeper life people. We are of another religion. Your wife will be talking and talking and talking. This is the way you'll be looking. If it is uh, here that uh, the uh, husband and wife, they have been coming to church, they have been coming to deeper life, and one day the husband uh, told the sister and said, uh, my sister, uh, this uh, deeper life we are going, Monday we go, Sunday we go, Thursday we go, Saturday we go, every time deeper life, every time deeper life, every time evangelism, every time this uh, house fellowship. Is this how we are going to, I don't think I will continue again. Uh, the wife will say, well, I cannot talk. Uh, your zona leader will come and talk to you if you like to. Today is Sunday. My husband, are you going today? Go, go and come. I am tired today. Well, bye. That's deeper life. If it's another place, another religion will not say bye, will draw him out of the bed and say, this religion, you'll practice it. That's where you married me. That's where we are children. That's where we baptize our infant children. We will go together. But Christian people, mm -mm, no zeal, no understanding, no fire. They will not even pray. But they will say, well, that's his decision. I will keep on serving the Lord. And if he doesn't want to continue serving the Lord, it's between him and the Lord. Adult worshippers will never do that. Unbelievers will never do that. What a challenge. That we who are here today, we do not have the commitment and the zeal that all the people have. Where is the testimony of our being born again? Where is the testimony of our being sanctified? Where is the testimony of our being baptized in the Holy Ghost? Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Acts, chapter 19, verse 34. Many verses we could read here, but let's just read verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You can see here that uh, these idol worshippers, when something happened that would have made them not to worship idol, they came out and then one of the people, Demetrius, a smith, a silver smith, a mage who had been making a silver shrine for Diana, and had brought no small gain to the craftsmen. He called upon all the other people in the labor union, and he said, our trade, our craft, is now in danger of being set aside. He said what? They called all the cities together. That's, they did publicity. They spoke out. When they saw that Paul came to Ephesus, and they knew that if this Paul the apostle, if he continued like this, that nobody will worship Diana again, they made publicity immediately. And all the city came together. Today, if you want to have any program, even as large as we are, and want to get everybody in the city to know about it, get them to the stadium, we say, well, you know, people today, they can't come out. They are afraid of going out in the night. They have difficulty. And they don't have any strength. All this house fellowship we're doing, this one is enough. Because you see these people, we need to know that this uh, SAP, this structural adjustment uh, program is really sapping people. We really need to sympathize with people. And if we say we're having crusade now, retreat now, program now, or church meeting now, or operation Andrew card, the thing we used to do, call people, the people will not come. So since we know they will not come, why are we worrying ourselves? Look at all these people. It was a difficult time in their time. For two hours, 
they were shouting and crying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Suppose I tell you to rise up and just say, Jesus is Lord, and say it for two hours. After ten minutes, some people will open their eyes and look at him. Is he still there? And uh, if it's not, if uh, they see I'm still here, uh, they sit down and then they bow their head. And then other people, after 15 minutes, will say, when are we going to end? They will look at their wristwatch. Eventually, before 30 minutes, everybody is quiet. But these idol worshippers, all their energy, for two hours, they were crying. What a challenge. What are we going to do now? In the midst of all this, look at all the religions. Look at what they are doing. Look at the revival of other religions. Look at all these ones that just came out now. They make their AI one kind. And, uh, you know, they call them a particular kind of name. And they go all about. Very, very aggressive. They put all their poster everywhere. As, as uh, one poster is, uh, you know, getting turned off, they put another one again in your house. Even near our church building, everywhere, they put everything that, uh, you know, they are just uh, going about. And a lot of people, whether they are Yoruba or Igbo, it doesn't matter. They will just be running about. And they look at this uh, fellow as their prophet, as their teacher, as, you know, their whatever it is. And even when their parents are saying, don't follow after them, don't go after them, they will, they will say, no, this is what we are going to follow now. Anglican church, Methodist church, Baptist church, many churches, they are losing members to all these people that are running about in worshipping this kind of new religion. And yet, what are we doing? You find a lot of young people that are joining them. If their parents uh, say, don't go there, don't go there, the children will say, no, that is the one we are going to worship today. We cannot control children. We cannot invite children. Young people will say, well, these uh, young people, if they follow us, their parents may sc stop their schooling. Their parents may go against them. Or this may happen. Or this may happen. And we allow them to perish. But look at all these religious people fanatical people. The way they will do things. Many of them, they will not sleep. Do you know there are people that uh, break their engagement because of, you know, some of these religions? They have been engaged together and now he joins, uh, you know, that kind of group where they cut their ear in a particular way and where they just go about like ruffians. And uh, the woman that is to marry said, are you going to this new I say, if you don't want to marry me because of that, you can go. That's the religion I'm going, to, I'm going to join. But you know, Christians, if they are engaged and they have been brothers and sisters in the church, and eventually one of them has said, well, I'm going to join Jehovah's Witnesses. Ah, brother, why are you going to do that now? Well, I think Jehovah's Witness is better for me. The woman will say, anyway, the will of God is will of God. Can never break that engagement will go and join to a Jehovah's Witness or seven day. What a pity. I pray God will wake us up. I pray God will challenge us. That by the grace of God, we will not just be so quiet and so foolish and so dark and, and uh, so dense that we will do what the Lord wants us to do in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 23 verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more, the child of hell than yourself. You see the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they did real evangelism, but the wrong kind of evangelism. They will compass land and sea, so that they will be able to turn these people to become Judaizers. You know in your office, how some religious people, they will spend long time with you. The manager, they will say, the manager is calling you. You will think the manager wants to discuss something about business or about, uh, you know, your, your work. And he will be saying, uh, Madam so-and-so, you are a good person and everybody likes you in this office. The only problem uh, there is that you refuse to worship God. How you say, uh, Oga, I'm worshiping God. Don't you know I'm a Christian? That's not what we are saying. You are not worshipping God. Eh? You see our own religi religion. He'll take his uh, something out and begin to count. And begin to say, you see, you don't worship God like this now. And your promotion is waiting. 
And everything is waiting. And if you come, you say, okay, I didn't know what you are. That's what you are going to say. I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. You go. The second day, during the break time again, they'll say, oh, guy is calling you. Oh, guy is never tired. He'll be pestering your life and telling you and reminding you. And he'll be saying, well, what do you even know about this, our religion? It's okay. Go and read this one. And tell me what you see there. Go and see this video. And, and tell me what you see there. Go and listen to this one. Tell me what you see. It'll be pestering your life. But Christian, Christian will never talk. Christian is not on the aggressive. Reaching out to the people and saying, this is the way of the Lord. The way of Christ is the way of the Lord. The way of the cross is the way of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why are we not evangelizing them? Didn't you know Jesus said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, ye shall know in no wise get into the kingdom of God. Look at their consecration. Let's become more consecrated. Look at the boldness of the idol worshippers and religious people. Let's have boldness. Look at their consecration and unity. Look at their zeal and look at their evangelism method. I pray that as the Lord has spoken to our hearts today, we'll never be silent again in Jesus' name. We will take up the challenge. We will do more than these people are doing. We will reach out to the people. We will call the people that have not been born again so that by the grace of God, they will be born again. O oh Lord, but start with me. Jesus, begin with me. Who will go for you, Lord? Are you there? Will you go for the Lord? Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me, Lord, send me. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Learn from the zeal of religious people. Learn from the unity among religious people. Learn from the commitment and consecration, the dedication and devotion of religious people. You see them out there dedicated in the village, in the city, in a place of work, how they try to influence everybody in their own religious way. Don't sleep. Don't fold your hands. Don't be idle. Don't be quiet. Name we prayed. Our Father, we are grateful for the words that you have spoken to us this afternoon. Father, we are all witnesses of the challenges that these people of other religions are posing to us. We see them in our zones, O oh Lord. We see them in our districts, O oh Lord. We see them in our neighborhoods. We see them among our relations who are not members of Deeper Life Bible Church, who do not have the grace of God in their lives. Father, we are really convinced that our love for Christ is fading away. Our commitment to the cross of cross is fading away. And Father, we are sure that there is no other way to heaven except the way of the cross. There is no other way to show that we love Jesus Christ, that we love the King of kings and the Lord of lords, except our commitment and our consecration to the cross of the cross. Today we are repenting. We are turning away. We are praying, Father, forgive us in Jesus' name. Father, how will you have people like us? And you'll be crying in heaven that you have nobody. You have saved us. You have sanctified us. Some of us, you have baptized us with the Holy Ghost. Why would Jesus be begging for workers? 
when you have given us your grace, you have given us your love, you have given us your spirit. Father, we are changing today. Father, we are turning today. By your grace, we will not fail you. We will be your mouth. We will be your hands. We will be your legs. And all this city, that we know that Jesus has brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Jesus is alive. Jesus is in heaven. And as long as Jesus reigns in our hearts, we will give our time. We will give our money. We will give our wisdom. We will give our knowledge. Whatever you have given us, Father, we lay all on the altar of consecration in Jesus' name. How will we be tired, O oh Lord? When did we start the work? How will we be weary, O oh Lord? When did we come into the gospel? We have not done much. There are still more lands to be conquered. There are still more souls to be won. Father, we pray this afternoon. Fill our hearts. Fill our lives with your love. Give us your passion afresh that we born unquenched in Jesus' name. We pray that the impact of this message will not leave us. As we go, it will burn. Born from our mouth, born within our heart, born in our eyes, born in our ears, born all through our system in Jesus' name. We thank you for hearing our prayers. As we continue in the meeting, Lord, continue with us. Speak to us, O Lord. We came as your servants. All that you have prepared for us. Help our pastor to teach us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.